See, in Soviet times, it was very, very difficult to find anything non-ideological to, to do. You either became a punk or you went to computers. Um, I didn't like beer, so I didn't, <laughs> at least from the outside, I didn't become a punk. So I went to computers. Welcome to this podcast created by the Estonia Briefing Center. In this series, we invite some of the most influential people in politics and business to discuss all angles of digitalization in Estonia and the world. From past learnings to current challenges and future plans. So take a seat, pour yourself a glass of your favorite drink and enjoy the art of digitalization. Hello and welcome to another episode of The Art of Digitalization. My name is Florian Marcus and today with us we have the Chief Technology Officer of Proud Engineers. His name is Andres Kutt. Andres, thank you so much for being with us. How are you doing today? Uh, could be better, could be worse. The common Estonian way. <laughs> In Estonian we say normalne, so normal. Yes, and yes, I guess that indeed, is quite indeed, indeed. appropriate that, today. That, that describes the circumstance quite perfectly, thank you. All right. Um, let's let's not hold ourselves up with any more niceties. Um, actually, uh, you have done an unbelievable amount of stuff during your career, and uh, there is uh, he's nodding right now, so it's very uh, yeah, very humbly. Um, uh, it's really difficult to talk about everything, but what I what I perhaps want to start with uh, is what you and your team and your colleagues have been working on uh, for the last couple of years. Mm -hmm. It's something called the CIO Index, yes. uh, which is sort of for uh, for an assessment of um, uh, how uh, chief information officers of countries uh, are acting, are supposed to act. Can you tell us more yeah. about what the CIO it, Index does? It's not even for a country level, because country is such an abstraction. Estonia is much smaller than many Indian states, for example. So why why would that index work on Estonia's uh, level, but not on on level of any any of Indian states, for example? True. Yeah. And so um, the it, it came about from actually having to talk to various sort of heads of government, and various officials, and and trying to sort of um, in our product development, trying to talk to customers, really, um, to understand where the situation is, where our products fit in, uh, where our expertise fits in, and how do we, how do we help these guys uh, the best? And it, it, at very rapidly, the questions started repeating themselves. Just, oh, but we're asking the same questions again and again and again. And from that, we decided, okay, so let's develop a tool that actually asks the same sorts of questions um, and it can be used for reflection for both the CIO who could sort of take this and sort of basically get a checklist as like where to draw, uh, to sort of direct their attention towards and as well to us to understand, okay, so this is the situation, like this is how we can approach this. Like these guys have, let's say, cybersecurity is fine, but electronic identity needs work or it's the other way around or the data management or like where are the shortcomings and where... Um, it's an exempl exemplary um, situation, so that's that's the origins of the of the index, basically. Uh, if we look at um, those that have responded to um, to this uh, survey so far, um, would you say that there are some weaknesses that are still universal, where effectively every let's say entity on Earth um, has the same amount Most, of work to do? Uh, not really, uh, because the differences are there. But the tendency is there to have electronic identity quite weak. Mm -hmm. It's quite universal. Um, in Europe, it tends to be better. Um, uh, elsewhere, it tends to be worse. Mm -hmm. um, also, interoperability uh, is is quite surprisingly good in certain certain circumstances, but it also it's an, it's an area where countries typically struggle. And these are both areas where it's imperative that the technological advancement and the policy advancement sort of co are combined into some sort of a holistic approach. Just rolling out technology isn't going to be sufficient, neither interoperability for elect or nor electronic ID. Mm. 
And these are the things that the countries really struggle with, or states, or whichever um, entity we are we are talking to. Um, it's the failure of. Um, uh, I, I, I recall the commonly when I explain this the story of Doctor Frankenstein, because Doctor Frankenstein, if you remember the movie, a very mm-hmm. spectacular scene in the tower. Um, there lies on a stretcher a collection of body parts, a basic technology. The te- technology is there, mm-hmm. but the body doesn't move, it doesn't do anything. But then there's what? There's a spark of lightning that animates the body. And from that point onwards, the thing is on its own. By the way, did you know that the Frankenstein monster was a vegan? I in, did in, not in, think in the, about in, that in, much, in, no. in, the <laughs> in the original, or original book. Um, but anyway, after the body gets animated, the, there's no, there's no uh, sort of point in the book where, or in the movies rather, uh, where the good doctor runs behind the monster with like turning a crank or carrying a battery. Mm-hmm. The monster is on its own. And very commonly, um, the governments sort of do the first part. They, they build the, like, pile technology into one big sort of chunk. And sometimes they manage to carry around or wheel around, mm-hmm. like on a wheelbarrow, this this collection of technology. Or like a puppet with strings and it seems yeah. like it's moving, but yeah. it's not. But yeah. it's not. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But very seldom do they manage to sort of ignite it, like create a sustainable ecosystem that really sort of takes off and sort of like starts walking on its own. And so this is where we typically can help. So what is that spark? I mean, you're not you're not supposed to tell us, of course, the the secret sauce of what you do. But um, I mean, one of the big discussions that that we've heard both in Estonia and abroad is, um, for example, how codified uh, do certain regulations have to be? For example, the ones only policy or anything like that, which in Estonia is sort of codified, sort of not. You know, um, yeah. so so what is the spark? It, 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 it depends um, on the on the country and on the, on the and on the circumstance. Mm. The if we we are getting theoretical, there's by the way, there's the um, beh- uh, underneath the the parable is is actually sort of actual scientific work and and actual sort of uh, mathematical models describing these sorts of situations. But basically, what you have is a stalemate, typically that needs to be overcome. That uh, you get a situation where nobody gets an ID card or a mobile device because there are no services. Mm-hmm. And why would a service provider integrate the device or or offer support for a device that no customers of theirs has? Mm-hmm. And so you get a stalemate where there are no customers because there are no services. There are no services because there are no customers. The same for interoperability. Whichever way you can find that it, that you get over this stalemate, works. In Estonia, we made the ID card compulsory. Mm -hmm. Um, And that worked. Uh, It was, and it's also sort of very natural, it was like four or five years of, or even more, of course, constant mocking of the government until it sort of started to take off, really. The the exponential growth started to take off, and it takes time. Um, But it took off eventually. Um, in in Scandinavia, it's different. Um, in both Finland and Sweden, what happened was that the banks came together and created the service the first. The private sector came yes. in. Yeah. The private sector, because the banks are like, for them, mitigating online risk is like one of the key things to drive down like business cost. Mm-hmm. So they, they separately in Finland and Sweden, so they came together, started offering these these. Um, identity devices or identity methods rather um, that were also already deeply integrated into all of the banks. So you had this massive kind of service support right away from day one and from there on sort of the adaption sort of took off. Yeah, You can do it both ways. You can do it from like, like Estonia did. You can do it from the service side like the Scandinavian countries did. Um, and you can use multiple methods. Like you can make a law to make the ID card compulsory. You can like you can utilize other other means. But the key thing is to get over that stalemate to provide that something that spark that sort of disrupts that that status quo. And if you manage to do that, you initiate an exponent- exponential growth, which is exactly what happened in the story. Like the monster starts walking, and, and then you hope that it's the right kind of monster and does <laughs> the right things. Well, look at what you created exactly. Yes. Um, so obviously Estonia has been going through these developments over the last, let's say, I mean, um, of, of practical implementation over the last 20 years, roughly. 
um, and and theoretical legal budgeting before that yeah. uh, already. Long before. Um, how did you personally experience these developments? Uh, where were you along the way in your in your different career stages and um, so on? I was I was very lucky because I was able to sort of I have been able to grow up professionally along with Estonian state. Um, I was born in 1975, and um, right about like right about then when when we regained our independence in 1991. Um, I was in high, sc uh, high school mm -hmm. and starting to play around with computers and there was already sort of some influx of, of, of technology and there was already this notion that, um, that you could do something with computers. Um, see, in Soviet times, there were, if you looked at the society, it was very, very difficult to find anything non-ideological to, to do. And that was... Um, computers were, 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 was, was a way out. You either became a punk or you went to computers. Um, I didn't like beer, so I <laughs> at least from the outside I didn't become a punk. So I went to computers. And um, so from there on, I think the uh, next sort of inter, uh, interconnection between what I, I did and the Estonian e-government was in 2000, I believe, mm -hmm. when I worked for Hansa Bank. We, we built internet banks Uh, back then, before it became Swedbank. Um, and um, the Stone and Tax and Customs Board came to us and said that, hey, we have this awesome service uh, that personal, um, private person uh, tax return filing that everybody needs to do. Um, but, and we have this internet service, but we have um, no way to identify the customers. And the bank had a situation where they wanted to get out of the get the customers out of their physical branches and on the internet. So they had and they had the ways to identify the customers, but no incentive for the customers to mm -hmm. go um, to the internet bank because everybody was accustomed to just pay their bills in the in the branches. And so I was the guy who was responsible for helping to sort of bridge that, to hand the identity over. Yeah. And that was the first sort of strong strong service then. And afterwards, um, uh, the, the person who was working uh, on the on the tax and customs side, uh, Mr. R. R. Uh, when I when I left the bank, uh, called me that hey, would you come and help to, to de develop the um, Estonian tax and customs board? Um, so you switched sides. Yes, I, I, yes, I did. Yes, Outrageous. I did. <laughs> uh, yes, I did. And then um, then I w witnessed the. Then I had the privilege to witness how X-Road was rolled out because X-Road was made compulsory right about the time when I was there. So I saw it from the sort of agency side. What was the resistance at the time against uh, adopting the X-Road as a, as a universal data exchange platform? It, it, was, it wasn't really a resistance per se, but it was the same sort of very practical, very pragmatic, very down-to-earth kind of stalemate thing. Mm -hmm. Because like this thing is quite useless. Like why, as a service provider, as an owner of a data set, why would I, why would I connect to that thing? <laughs> It's not even that complicated, but why would I do that? I have many, many, like we were in the process of joining the European Union. Yeah. Like that's a lot of work. We went from having two information systems, tax system and custom system, to launching 14 information systems on mm -hmm. the 1st of May of 2000, whatever that was, uh, when we joined the European Union. Four. So, 2004. Yeah. Must must have been earlier. Well, anyway, doesn't matter. It's ancient history. Um, so there was a lot of work. So why would we be bothering with X-Road? Um, but there was the e edict came down and we had to do it. Um, and for most things, we could even find a customer of ours, like somebody to talk to on the X-Road. But for customers, we didn't. Mm -hmm. Because the custom system is, a, is a quite an esoteric thing. It, like nobody really cares about it. <laughs> You, you can't ask useful questions. You don't know whether somebody owes the state money from yeah. that system. It's like, and so, but we had to connect it to Excel, and so we implemented the service um, that, in technical terms, uh, returned the system date of the database the, of the customs uh, system. So you had this Excel service. You could ask the Excel what time it was <laughs> at customs. It was utterly useless, but uh, <laughs> but that meant that we had to install the security servers and get the, get, go through the motions of setting uh -huh. up the, the X-Road. And 
that, that meant in turn that we connected up. And that, that meant that when the next time somebody showed up and said, hey, can we exchange this data? We already had the infrastructure in place mm -hmm. and we naturally sort of fell towards X road rather than an alternative. So by now, the Tax and Customs Board or the Customs side is connected to more than just the, the yes, time of day? Yes, That's excellent it's, it's, news. It's, it's much more now. Great. It's much more complicated and much more, uh, much more elaborate right now. But it started with exactly the same sort of uh, reluctance and the same sort of gap you see on the, uh, on the ID card. Mm -hmm. Because you get this sort of exponential growth in terms of usage. Yeah. But you, you get this sort of upward slowing scope, slope uh, in terms of devices being handed out because it's a compulsory thing and the numbers grow quite rapidly. And you get this thing that we call the evil eye in between when there's for very many years, like several, several years, there's a big gap between the devices issued and devices being used. Mm -hmm. And unless you write this gap out, you're able to sort of politically sort of sit out and, and explain your constituents that, hey, wait, 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 it's growing. Wait, it's going to work. It's not going to work unless mm. you wait that evil eye out. Yeah. You, you can't win. And it was this, exactly the same thing with x mm -hmm. uh, If we hadn't waited out the time and, and until there was only the, the time asking service, uh, we wouldn't have x -Road. But we yeah. did and we have. Um. Now, you also work with the Estonian government on some uh, projects these days, I, yes, I believe. Yes, yes, we do. Can you tell us more about uh, what that would include um, to the extent that you can? Oh, um, we are mainly in the process of... Um, we're currently actually finishing up a very interesting project, which mm -hmm. is um, uh, the uh, question of how do you manage permissions in a government setting? Mm -hmm. um, like when um, when you run a business or even in, in your private life, there are situ many situations where people can represent other people or other legal entities, and it's always very tedious to go from organization to organ to from the tax board to the board of education to board of statistics to board of health or whomever, mm -hmm. and constantly explain to them. Like justify who, yourself who is, no yeah. not yourself but who is authorized to act on, on behalf of you yeah and sometimes the logic isn't very clear or very, very simple for example there are situations where a uh, employee of the local municipality can act as the legal representative of a person mm -hmm. living in that municipality and not everybody cares or, or knows how to implement this logic. Mm -hmm. So how do we go about that, solving that issue? And so we are figuring that out. Uh, we are just completing the architecture and prototyping, prototyping of that sort of service. Um, we have worked on um, things like um, event-based services. Mm -hmm. So what happens if, if people get married and how does that work out? It only goes downhill from then, yeah. Um, uh, Depends on the perspective because <laughs> they, 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 there's always an uphill and always a downhill <laughs> if you're looking up or if you're looking down. Um, and so uh, we, are, we are solving that thing. Um, no, so by solving, we mean that we figure out how to build this. Well, yeah, what does that involve if you, if you talk about a life event ah. uh, or life-based service? It's, uh, it's a simple, simple question, really, uh, from the customer's perspective, customer being the Estonian government at, mm -hmm. at the time. And the, from their perspective, what they like, they are expressing the need of the citizen. And they went and asked the citizen. And very naturally, the, the citizen would like to sort of have this sort of service where you just express the wish to get married. Yeah. You click through a flow. You say that uh, you either want to change your name or you don't want to change your mm. name. Um, you want to specify the details. When you want to get married, do you want an, a band there or do you want like which rooms or, and so forth. You pick time from the, from the calendar. Uh, you click next, 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 next. You pay for all the, all the state fees and you, the, for the service and for the new documents you're going to have if you change the name and all of that stuff. And then you click OK and then you're done. Mm -hmm. And wouldn't it be marvelous if that was the actual sort of customer experience? Um, and so it was our struggle to figure out how to do that because unfortunately... Uh, all the different elements 
uh, of this process are operated by different uh, parts of the government. And uh, municipalities have a sort of constitutional independence from the state, mm-hmm. so you can't even tell them how to, how to do things. So how do we make this thing happen? And uh, yeah, we developed several alternatives, we presented them to the customer, and I, and I do hope that eventually these will be built. Um, Fingers crossed. Um, I got married earlier this year, roughly half a year ago, and uh, and one of the challenges that that we had did not have to do. I mean, of course, it was on paper. You know, you still had to go to uh, to what's called the uh, talent department of vital statistics. Um, but uh, also, I am to this day, and dear Germans, please stop listening right now. Uh, not legally married in Germany because you would have had to go to the German embassy and then also uh, call uh, the last um, uh, public office uh, in the municipality where you lived in Germany. So when I was 19, <laughs> uh, I would have to get back in touch with them uh, and uh, send some paper there and, you know, so all of these different things. So even if it is perfectly automated inside Estonia, there are so many things where we depend on other uh, kingdoms, it's, let's it's, say. It's, it's not only you. That's the thing. <laughs> I'm sure it's, it's not just it's, me. <laughs> it's, it's, the, it's the common... Uh, back in the 60s, I believe, the US military decided to design a fighter, uh, fighter jet. Mm-hmm. And they decided that uh, because they, they, they would be getting pilots from all walks of life and all different body, body sizes and all different body shapes, that they would measure all the uh, recruits take an average and design f- f- the pilot seat for the average pilot. Mm-hmm. And of course it turned out that the, the pilot seat was awful for every <laughs> single person uh, because there is no average person. Yeah. And every single person getting married is going to have their own peculiarities and, mm-hmm. and, and being, being not Estonian is one of them. Yeah. Uh, which we grudgingly accept yep. nowadays. <laughs> Tolerate. Uh, to- we, we, and we, we, all, we tend to accept. Um, and f- these summed up, end up g- creating a situation where your entire process is basically a, a corner case. Mm-hmm. And that makes this, in conjunction with many, many um, uh, stakeholders at play, makes this a very tricky information system to build. It's uh, one of those things that it is very easy to figure this out as an information system but it is very difficult to figure this out as a sort of um, human system mm-hmm. like how does it actually work like how, how would that process work from the maintenance perspective yeah. like if the municipality of Tartu decides that from now on they're offering a venue for getting married mm-hmm. additional one Currently, they have like two or three. So how would that work? Like, who do they, do they talk to whom? How does like how often does does that happen? It happens maybe once in like five years. Yeah, but it does happen. But it does yeah. happen, and you you can't offer it really self service because, like, to whom? Which of the many representatives or <laughs> public servants in Tartu municipality would be authorized to make that change? Like how? And all of these in the nitty gritty details gets jolly complicated very yeah, fast. I can imagine. What's the um, the most exciting part of your job uh, these days, uh, the most exciting project uh, that really gives you uh, fire and boost in the morning? Um, because it's uh, we're recording this uh, in the weeks leading up to Christmas, then most projects <laughs> are actually wrapping up. Yeah. So um, at this stage, I would say that uh, um, because it's very frantic and very hectic uh, mm-hmm. with with all projects, I don't I can't really say that any of them give me this this uh, this warm boost because at the end of the project you very rarely um, <laughs> feel like that. Um, for for the um, for the permissions management, I I really enjoyed that. Project. Yeah. That was really fun. But if you're asking what's been this... Um, I, I was about to say, let's cast hmm. our minds back to the moment that the tender got accepted. Which tender um, acceptance made you the happiest? Uh, must be the permissions, yeah. yeah. The, that, 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 was, that was awesome because it's, it's technically non-trivial and it's process-wise non-trivial um, in a sense that uh, all the uh, larger enterprises to the permissions and, and authorization and, and account management, the identity management, they mm. all do it. 
it's it's commercially easily available many many solutions from active directory to google solutions to whatever yeah but the trick is how do i make it so that it's it can be integrated into all of the Estonian information systems all of them mm-hmm. without having to spend gazillion euros of rebuilding all of them yeah and how do you make it so that it's configurable and it's actually adoptable and it's actually possible to roll out and you can you can get the the parties on board mm-hmm. and so and it also accommodates for like the range of we did a survey in this project uh, in terms of the needs of the uh, public agencies and uh, we found that uh, the spectrum ranged from the um, Estonian Tax and Customs Board that mm-hmm. has, I, I gladly see, the most elaborate and complex permission management. You can, you can authorize an auditor to access individual date ranges of individual declaration types, if you so wish. Like it's really elaborate, it's and really yeah. complex, like very, very advanced system. And on the other hand, you have we had one agency who basically said that you Here's know, a server you can access. Let's go. Basically, yes, because it's it's filing of reports. <laughs> yeah. And if you file a report uh, about the company that you have no relationship with, yeah, you get a warning that uh, if you do this, it's a felony. But because it's not not, not harming anyone, then why 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 would I? Like, nobody does that. We're not going to name and shame anyone, are we? Yeah. And no. and yeah. and but it, it makes perfect sense. Yeah. Like it's a viable working business function. Yeah. And so our permissions management had to sort of account for all that spectrum. Mm-hmm. And that was quite tricky. And that was imagine. enjoyable. That was enjoyable. Um, if we now look at the future for just a few moments, mm-hmm. um, what do you think are the, the biggest obstacles in Estonia's path? And to what extent do they differ from the paths of the rest of the world? For digitalization, um, Estonia is in a much, much more difficult uh, situation than most of the rest of the world. Because for the most of the rest of the world, um, the as I said earlier, the challenges are very simple. In a sense that you need to sort out electronic identity, you need to sort out in some way the interoperability of data exchange. And if you have those sorted out, then your journey begins and and you can get to um, interesting places. For Estonia, the challenge is to um, solve the next layer of problems. Unfortunately, we have spent the last 20, 25, 30 years solving the easy ones. Mm -hmm. And now only the really, really tricky ones are left. It's time for the high-hanging fruit. Now it's yeah. <laughs> exactly now. Now we need to reach for the high hanging fruits, and that gets more complicated by year. And now we can't. You can you can no longer get by by just applying technology. It used to be that you just throw a problem at at a few engineers, and they came back with a solution. It got implemented, and hey presto, you have Xroad. Mm-hmm. Um, it's not not like that anymore because now we need to sort of uh, figure out those complex social technical systems, and it, we have legacy. You need to change that. And it becomes a strategic and leadership issue more and more and more and more and less of a technology issue. And that transition for Estonia that has been traditionally very Mm engineering-led is quite difficult. Um, We're getting there, I'm confident. But that is the biggest challenge, I think. Do you feel like the degree of technological innovation or digital society development in Estonia has decreased over the years. Um, Probably to an extent, it has to be that way because Mm -hmm. we built those foundations. And do you think that that has anything to do with um, the careerization of politics i mean looking back to the 1990s Mm. when just you know a bunch of young people just said you know screw it let's try you know let's if we fail what's the worst thing that can happen and that these days people feel like they have more to lose just like in older democracies uh in in the rest of the world uh, um i don't think it's this it's an issue with a digitization per se Mm -hmm. um it's an issue for the entire society um, and I think that's one of the crucial things um, to see that there is no digital society. There is just society. And whatever the society goes through and, and whatever phases and whatever stages, the digital society goes through. 
And you are absolutely right that the Estonian society is at a state where everybody has a lot of things to lose. Mm. And that changes things. At the same time, if I look at the next generation, look at what uh, the startup community is starting doing, that is very, very interesting. You know, like, well, For me, it's awesome to see that we are seeing a shift. And the shift is that all of a sudden, the Estonian business elite, and the, that, that, that break point is going to be very, very soon, in a few years, I believe. All of a sudden, the majority of Estonian business elite does not have to be ashamed of their first million. Mm-hmm. Um, it used to be that like, you, you never, never spoke about how, you, how people <laughs> earned their first million in the, in the beginning of the 90s. Yeah. Um, and that is decreasingly so. And you get uh, Stan Damgivis and Tavek Inrikas and Dwight Cockfers and, and others um, going about and like looking at society and going, hey, I can change that. Mm-hmm. And that is going to be very, very, very interesting. It's, it's the next generation is, is picking up and that I'm, I'm just so anticipating this, like looking forward to this. Uh, I hope the the dear listeners at home are feeling this optimism just as much as we are right now. Um, it's a very rare story. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, Doesn't come naturally. Let's mark it in our calendars. Uh, Andres, uh, thank you so much for, for your time and for your insights. Uh, it's been a pleasure to talk to you. And dear listeners at home, I hope you had an enjoyable time as well. We are hearing you back at the next uh, episode of The Art of Digitalization. See you then. And that's the end of yet another thought-provoking conversation about The Art of Digitalization. In the meantime, make sure to stay connected with eEstonia on Facebook, Twitter and LinkedIn. You can also check out our website e-estonia.com to learn more about digitalization in this beautiful country and other upcoming events. For now, that is all from our side. Stay tuned for our next podcast episode and have a great day. Thank you.